Good morning, everyone. Salam alaikum. Welcome from me as well. It's my privilege to be your moderator for this um, next discussion. It's also a pleasure for me personally to be in Abu Dhabi, which is actually the city that I grew up in many years ago. I spent many happy years here. And actually, I come from a medical family, and I was thinking as I prepared for this, that when my father first came to the UAE as a doctor in about 1975, public health programs in this part of the world would have been just beginning. And of course, we're in a very, very different world here today. But the next discussion is going to build on what you have already heard this morning about reaching every child, because we're going to unveil something really ambitious and unique a comprehensive strategy on how together we can achieve a polio-free world by the end of 2018. It is an ambitious goal. It's been the goal of health professionals for a very long time, and yet right now, it is within reach. The next six years provide a really momentous opportunity because worldwide, polio cases are at a historic low, a record low, and that is what means that this moment in time is a really unique one. Now, in my work in the BBC newsroom, I do often, especially recently, see polio make the headlines for all the wrong reasons, most notably with the targeting of polio workers in Pakistan. But, you know, even there, the work has gone on because it's work that is just too important to be derailed. The anti-polio drive has many champions, and some of them are on the stage right now, and they'll be talking to you about the work that they've done in different parts of the world. Um, but the plan you're about to hear about is costed, it is evidenced, and it is based on a blueprint that has been proven to work already in India. So it has really been thought through. India remains polio-free after two years, as many of you will know, and the plan you're about to hear is a final global push to um, free the world from this debilitating disease. So, we have a very large panel here on stage, as you can see, and you're gonna hear from each person in turn uh, about uh, their plan and the role that they're going to play in, um, in the part of all of this. I'll be moving everyone on when their time is up, and then uh, we will, of course, have time for your questions and the discussion um, at the um, end before we, before we go for lunch. So, I mentioned the landmark success of polio eradication in India already, and we're going to begin um, with the man who really led that charge in India and was part of some really fantastic work that happened there. He is now the World Health Organization's Director of Polio, Hamid Jafri. Would you like to begin, Mr. Jafri? Thank you very much, Michelle, and it's an honor uh, for me to uh, share with you this uh, strategic plan and also what lessons we have learned that have driven the development of this uh, strategic plan. 2012 was a very extraordinary year for public health uh, and particularly for polio. Uh, as we heard from uh, Sheikh Lubna Qasimi uh, last night, that the fewest number of cases were reported from the fewest number of countries in 2012. Angola stopped transmission of re-established virus, as did Democratic Republic of Congo. India was taken off the list of uh, four countries that had remained uh, endemic. And the success in India really removed the doubt about the technical or biological feasibility of uh, polio eradication from the most, uh, from the largest, the most tenacious and enduring reservoir for, for polio uh, in the world. Uh, we um, also uh, faced some horrific outbreaks in recent years as polio virus spread internationally from the remaining reservoirs and started to paralyze not only children but adults. And when adults get polio, more of them actually die uh, than children. Uh, who get, get polio. So that gave a further sense of urgency to contain the virus as quickly as, as possible, so that in 2012, uh, the World Health Assembly uh, declared completion of polio eradication a, a programmatic emergency for global public health. The countries responded uh, tremendously, particularly the remaining endemic countries and the partners, and uh, made a tremendous effort, transformative work on the ground that led to the progress that we, that we saw last year. 2012 was also a particularly challenging year because more countries for the first time reported cases of polio due to 
the vaccine-derived poliovirus and the wild poliovirus, and we now know that most of that is due to type 2 virus, the wild variety of which was eradicated more than 10 years ago. So it's become clear that the best solution to that problem is actually to withdraw the type 2 component of the OPV. So the World Health Assembly also uh, directed us to develop an end game strategic plan uh, that addresses both the eradication of wild poliovirus but also manages risks that are associated with the continued use of the type 2 vaccine and ultimately all, all OPV. So th hence this strategic plan. And the plan is very, very, uh, it's a transformative plan. This is the first time we've had a polio eradication plan that is for a six year, six year period. It has four objectives to detect and interrupt poliovirus transmission, and a radical departure for the first time giving primacy to strengthening of routine immunization at the same time as we withdraw a, the oral polio vaccine, the type 2 first. So real radical departure, as that was mentioned by Tori Godal yesterday, uh, that this is very new and this is going to force us all to work in a very, very different way across the countries, across the entire immunization partnership, because this is about getting every child vaccinated. The, the other uh, objectives of this plan are related to containment of virus and, and, and ultimate certification of eradication, and then creating a roadmap for establishing the legacy of polio eradication, the broader benefits. How do we secure the gains that this, uh, this uh, program has, has made? Now, the first objective about eradication of, of the circulating uh, polio virus, we've learned very important uh, lessons in India. We learned uh, about the uh, what it takes really to vaccinate 172 million children repeatedly in a country with enormous uh, socioeconomic, geographic, and cultural uh, uh, diversity. We also learned what it takes to reach the most marginalized children, about 4.2 million children uh, that are among, among the migrant uh, population. Um, and in this regard, I would like to say that I had the, the, the honor to, to meet with uh, Madam Shanaz Wazir Ali, Minister Pate in India, to discuss the lessons we've learned in that country of how to eradicate polio. And we had many years to build to that level. They have done a fantastic job of bringing their countries much faster, closer to eradication. We had more time in India, and, and really credit goes to what they have done. Secondly, I think I, I must address the issue of security, and I think we'll come back to that uh, in our discussion. But it's very, very heartening to, to see that despite the attacks, both of these countries have continued to vaccinate children, and workers have gone back in the very areas where they were attacked. So maybe I'll stop here and uh, back to you, you, Michelle. Thank you very much. So it's, it's a strategic plan. It is an end game um, to eradicate polio. So many donor countries are providing the funds that is making all of this possible. And sitting right next to um, Hamid Jaffrey is Canada's Minister of International Cooperation, Julian Fantino. Now, Canada has been a long time donor to this cause. Um, Mr. Fantino. Well, thank you and uh, good morning, everyone. It is indeed my great pleasure on behalf of the Government of Canada to address this uh, honorable gathering. And as you know, vaccines are among the most cost-effective investments in global health, saving 2.5 million lives each year. And that is why it is uh, so frustrating and a travesty, really, that uh, every 20 seconds a child dies from a vaccine-preventable condition. However, the fight against polio remains, uh, and it also reminds us of what can be accomplished when forces come together. Over the past two decades, polio cases have decreased by 95, 99%, and of course the work uh, that remains will be the most challenging going forward. Today, polio remains endemic in only three countries, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Nigeria. Still, despite being able to see the end of polio, significant challenges will remain and, and do remain. In addition to the last of the cases being in remote and difficult to reach areas, we continue to face extremist and unrelenting attacks on polio vaccination workers and the police officers who are protecting them. The active engagement of Islamic organizations, countries, and leaders is no more important than right now. Canada urges them to continue promoting factual information and to help ensure a safe environment for polio workers. Despite these challenges, one thing is clear. Canada's resolve to see the end of polio has never been stronger. 
With Canada's help, 80% of children in the world are now routinely immunized. In Afghanistan, for example, Canada has helped immunize more than 7 million children against polio. Our determination to eradicate polio will help children and their families lead healthy and productive lives, ultimately reducing global poverty. With that, I am pleased that Canada is the first country to officially announce our pledge at this particular summit to help make polio history. Over the next six years, Canada will invest $250 million to fight against polio. This pledge... <laughs> this pledge represents an increase of 41% over our previous annual commitment. An investment of this magnitude builds on our ongoing commitment to polio eradication. Our commitment also reflects the confidence we have in our partnership with the Gates Foundation and the Global Polio Eradication Initiative. This investment will support rapid implementation of the polio eradication and endgame strategic plan. We will continue to work with our Canadian and international partners to allocate the entire pledge and find ways to leverage further private investments. As we approach the finish line, we must remember that the success achieved against polio will lay the foundation to combat other preventable diseases, including such things as poverty and the destruction of lives. Thank Together, you. we can make polio history once and for all. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Fantino, and thank you for that pledge. Thank you. Remember, in all, this, this comprehensive strategic plan is going to need five and a half billion dollars, and that pledge from Canada will, is clearly going to be important to achieving the ultimate um, goal that brings us all together. So we've already touched on the polio endemic countries, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Nigeria, and I'm delighted that they're all represented on this um, panel today. I'd like to go uh, next um, to the Afghan Minister of Health, who's been absolutely crucial to all of this. She's someone I've spoken to on the BBC where she's more than willing to come into our Kabul um, bureau and um, talk to a presenter in London who she can't see and, you know, stand outside in, in the cold and, and wet sometimes, um, <laughs> talking about the issues that are important. So clearly the work in a country like yours is going to be vital. Saraya Dalil. Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum, good morning. Thank you for this opportunity. I would like to express our gratitude to the government of United Arab Emirates for hosting this summit, to Mr. Bill Gates for his leadership and tremendous effort to eradicate polio, as well as to our international partners, development partners, to our United Nations colleagues, and all who made this effort possible. Polio eradication is one of the highest priority for the government of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. When I say Afghanistan, I'm referring to the commitment of the President, the Ministry of Public Health, other relevant ministries, and very importantly, provincial governors and district governors. We know that political commitment is made effective only by local ownership and accountability. Accountability and ownership at the community level, at the district level, and at the provincial level. That's why we have been engaging a lot the provincial governors and, and district governors to make sure that every child is vaccinated, especially in provinces and districts that we have a very low coverage of vaccination. In the last couple of months, we have also developed National Emergency Action Plan to eradicate polio, which focuses on major challenges of improving management and accountability, increase community demand, improve access through local level negotiations, and very importantly, linkages with the routine immunization. Our National Emergency Action Plan is not solely a technical plan, it takes into account the man managerial, socio-political, and security obstacles that we all face in Afghanistan. Ladies and gentlemen, management and accountability continue to be the focus of our work in Afghanistan. We have made progress on this one. For example, we have made changes in structures 
work on capacity building and training. We have streamlined some of our procedures and also improved financial management through greater oversight and changes in fund flow mechanisms that are currently being rolled out. Considering the environment and the challenges we have in Afghanistan, we have also uh, did some innovative approaches. For example, ending polio is my responsibility, is the theme of the polio eradication uh, vaccination campaigns that started all over the country and it involved many, many players and st stakeholders, including, um, including the ministers, the governors, teachers, mullahs, religious leaders, police um, and, and all other uh, parents themselves, um, youth and young people to, to be part of this polio, polio eradication. Minister. So the theme of that was ending polio is my responsibility. Thank you. Perhaps we can hear more about um, Afghanistan exactly. in the discussion. Thank you very much indeed. Well, on the donor front, we've already had um, a pledge from Canada. Um, I'd like to turn next um, to Germany, which actually earlier this year made a significant pledge um, on polio. And the State Secretary of Germany's Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development is Hans-Jürgen Beerfels. Thank you, but uh, let me mention one paramount point uh, firstly. Uh, I think uh, we need uh, better coordination. Uh, Germany strongly supports uh, uh, the action plan, the strategic plan, and its uh, principles, uh, but we see it as a part uh, of WHO's uh, Global Vaccine Action Plan, and uh, Margaret is uh, sitting over there, and uh, we are thinking uh, uh, a leading role in coordination of all uh, should be with uh, the WHO, and uh, we need reforms uh, for that uh, within the WHO framework, uh, but uh, I think it's a necessity uh, that uh, better coordinate coordination is organized by WHO. And taking uh, this into account, uh, uh, Germany decided uh, to uh, support uh, the uh, Gavi, Global Alliance on Vaccination and Immunization, uh, for the next year uh, uh, with uh, 100 million euro and uh, Germany decided uh, to give another 100 million euro uh, to uh, the GPEI. It is a historical uh, chance. Uh, it is a once-in-a-lifetime situation for all of us to eradicate uh, uh, polio, and uh, it was uh, difficult for Germany. We are also in uh, certain problems uh, concerning our budget uh, situation. Uh, but uh, uh, Bill Gates uh, convinced us, uh, he has uh, uh, specific uh, convincing charm and uh, 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 that specific kind of uh, uh, pressure into uh, the, uh, the opinion building process in uh, Germany. And so uh, we decided uh, to do this uh, uh, total amount of uh, 200 million euro, which is uh, roughly around 250 uh, million US dollars. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I'm imagining that combination of charm and, and pressure is um, probably pr pretty hard to resist. Thank you. But you make a very important point about how uh, the benefits of this will hopefully um, not just be about polio, about a, a broader vaccination a plan and a network, um, a broader health network as well. Thank you. So many different stakeholders are taking part in this um, strategy to end polio. Uh, you will also hear it referred to as the GPEI, which is the name of this plan but essentially it's the same six-year plan that we're talking about. Regional leadership is also playing a vital role, especially on financing support. And I'm delighted that with us today is the president of the Islamic Development Bank, Ahmed Mohammed Ali Al-Madani. Dr. Ali, I think you're going to speak in Arabic. Thank you, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I prepared my statement for 10 minutes in Arabic, so those who want to listen, with your permission. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. أصحاب المعالي أيها الأخوة والأخوات سلام من الله عليكم جميعا ورحمته وبركاته بداية أود أن أسجل الشكر 
نيابة عن مجموعة البنك الإسلامي للتنمية لسمو الشيخ محمد بن زايد آل نهيان ولي عهد أبو ظبي ونائب القائد الأعلى للقوات المسلحة في دولة الإمارات العربية المتحدة ولمعالي السيد بان كيمون الأمين العام للأمم المتحدة ولسيد بيل جيتس الرئيس المشارك لمؤسسة بيل وميليندا جيتس على رعايتهم الكريمة لتنظيم هذه القمة الهامة كما أتوجه بالشكر لكم جميعا أيها المشاركون الأعزاء على التزامكم وحضوركم إن النهوض بالتنمية البشرية هو من صميم اهتمامات البنك الإسلامي للتنمية حسب ما يتجلى في رؤى البنك لآفاق عام 1440 هجرية 2020 بجن وفي بيان مهمته وقد استرشد البنك بالقرارات والتوصيات الصادرة عن القمة الاستثنائية الثالثة لمنظمة التعاون الإسلامي التي عقلت عام 2005 في مكة المكرمة فجعل من أولى أولوياته النهوض بالصحة من خلال الوقاية من الأمراض الوبائية والمعدية إلى جانب تعزيز النظام الصحي تعتبر الشراكة والتعاون والتنسيق مع المؤسسات الشقيقة الأخرى والشركاء الأساسيين من الأولويات الاستراتيجية للبنك الرامية إلى تعبئة المزيد من الموارد وينظم البنك ويضم البنك يضم في عضويته 22 دولة من الدول الأقل نموا ولما كان القطاع الاجتماعي وقطاع الصحة في الدول العضاء الأقل نموا تحديدا يعاني من نقص في التمويل ودعما للجهود العالمية لاستئصال شر الأطفال قام البنك باعتماد أسلوب التشاركي للتمويل كمصدر لتمويل المشاريع المشتركة وفي هذا الصدد يتعاون البنك كذلك مع التحالف العالمي للقاحات والتطعيم وأخيرا الحقيقة أود أن أعبر عن سرور البنك المشاركة في هذه القمة ويعتزم البنك إن شاء الله ويؤكد مجددا حرصه والتزامه على تقليم الدعم والتكاتف مع جميع الأطراف المعنية من أجل تحسين أحوال الشعوب والارتقاء بصحة البشرية جمعاء باعتبارهم جيراننا في قريتنا الكونية وقد أوصانا الرسول الأعظم صلى الله عليه وسلم بالجار وما زال يوصي به حتى ظننا أنه سيورثه وسلام من الله عليكم جميعا ورحمته وبركاته Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Well, I'd like to turn to uh, Pakistan uh, next and to Shanaz Wazir Ali, who is the, pres uh, the, uh, the Prime Minister's advisor on, on polio and therefore the key person pushing polio programs through. And I have to say that when, as I said earlier, polio hit the headlines for the wrong reasons in Pakistan, I assumed, actually, that the eradication program had had to be at least suspended in some of those areas. But actually, the work carried on. And I think that is really an example of just the commitment and the drive to actually get this job finished. Shanaz Wazir Ali. Thank you very much, Misha. Um, the power of this summit uh, which will translate, I think, into significant changes at the country and the lo local levels, is about bringing people together, coalescing people, building the partnerships and the, and the coalitions. And uh, truly, the summit is an amazing summit. It's come at the right time. It's historical. And uh, you can hear the commitments that have been pledged, uh, Canada, Germany, <laughs> several other countries, and the multiple partners that we have around the table. Uh, so Pakistan would like to take this opportunity very much to thank uh, Sheikh uh, Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, the government of the UAE, Mr. Bill Gates, and several countries, um, including Japan, uh, Australia, Canada, Germany, who assist us in this effort. WHO and UNICEF are very important partners for us, and so is Rotary International. In Pakistan, uh, since you referred to the fact that, of course, uh, Pakistan hits the headlines and media takes up issues when we have the unfortunate and very tragic incidents of the killing of polio workers. And these martyred workers, of course, are our frontline heroes, without any doubt. Uh, most of them were women who were targeted. However, the program in most parts of Pakistan continues to produce good results. And I think it's important to recognize that and to highlight that. From a near epidemic situation of about 144 cases in 2010 and 198 in 2012, we're down to six cases this year. 
Um, and uh, the reservoirs have been reduced from 12 to about four. So the results are beginning to demonstrate that the action plan has the key features. It has the instruments, the tools, the procedures and processes, uh, the infrastructure. But let me make one or two other critical points in addition to the fact that we are monitoring and there is accountability and of course, the crit criticality and centrality of strengthening health systems because we do want the synergies between the polio eradication effort, which is in a campaign mode, it's in a very intensive focused mode, to synergize, harmonize, and to have these rational linkages so that we can deliver better the larger immunization program, what we refer to in Pakistan as the expanded program of immunization, which includes all the other vaccines. And I think this summit, more than any other, has highlighted that as we go into the last six years, this last mile, we really need to ensure that we are not only campaign-focused uh, polio eradication efforts, but really moving very rapidly uh, to build uh, the capacities in the system. And our federal minister, Dr. Sanya Nishta, did speak about the issue of capacity. However, I, I would like to say that, um, uh, that when you demonstrate results, and as we have in some, in, as I said, in several parts of Pakistan, it builds confidence amongst the people. Uh, what we would like to move to is a position of not only ensuring that supplies are there, vaccine management, logistics, cold chain, and all of that, and that the polio workers get to the doorstep. What we would like to see very much is an assertive, proactive demand for immunization. And how do you move to that situation? Yeah. And I think that for us is, is quite a major challenge. I'll come back hopefully to discussing other things when there's an opportunity for a larger discussion. Yes, we'll learn Thank more you. in the discussion. Um, let's go now to another one of the um, donors represented on the uh, panel today. The UK has been uh, committed to health-related causes and um, despite a climate of financial difficulty has not cut back on its international development um, budget. And with us is um, Britain's Minister of State for International Development, Alan Duncan. Michelle, thank you. The, the, the biggest challenge I face at the moment is that I'm a very small minister sitting in a very big chair. <laughs> and um, <laughs> when I say I'm so busy that my feet hardly touch the ground, at the moment it's true. But, um, there's a lot of enthusiasm in this room, and so there should be, because we are in the final lap of a very exciting success story. And I think we've already seen an, an amazing combination of private and public initiative. And I think that what Bill Gates has done makes him nothing short of a, a global hero, in my view. I think that we are in the final lap, and if we give it one more push, we can do it. Now, the UK has, uh, and will remain, absolutely committed to polio eradication, uh, and we know we've got to stick with it to the very end and see it through. So what you are probably all waiting to hear is quite how much we are going to pledge. Um, so this is something that makes me more popular abroad than at home, but never mind. Um, likewise, the UK, I'm very proud to say, will reach our target this year of providing 0.7% of national income on aid. And in <clears throat> ensuring our taxpayers' money is well spent uh, on what matters is our top priority. And so convinced are we that polio eradication is a good investment and the right thing to do that today I'm very pleased to announce a commitment over the next six years of up to 300 million pounds. This uh, equates to about 450 million dollars and we don't make this pledge lightly or free of conditions. We look to the many countries represented here today to step up to the plate as well and help seize the chance to condemn polio to history. We also want our investment to go beyond polio campaigns. We believe firmly that we will not win against polio unless we strengthen routine immunization and the health services that try to reach people in the most difficult places in these countries. And we expect good evidence on progress against milestones and full transparency over what the money is buying. We also look forward, and we've heard it today, to unflagging political commitment from endemic countries and development partners, because eradication needs a continuing team effort if it's to succeed. 
So the team effort is here today. We look forward to a future safe from the scourge of polio, and the UK will be enormously proud to have shared in that achievement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Alan Duncan. So I said earlier on that the plan that is being um, talked about today is based on a blueprint that has been proven to work in India. India was actually a country, many of you will know this, but India was a country which many thought was absolutely impossible to eradicate from, from polio. But as Dr. Jaffrey already talked about, it has been done, at least it's been polio free for two years now. And um, what happened in India, uh, was also a tribute to the role that civil society played uh, because Rotary International, for instance, was one of the organizations that did incredible work in India, not just raising funds, but recruiting volunteers. And there was something like two million vaccinators out there in India. So it gives you a sense of the, of the scale of the task. And I'm really pleased that the National Polio Plus Committee Chair from Rotary India, Deepak Kapoor, is with us today. Thank you, Michelle. A story of uh, 30 years and three minutes, it should be easy. You can do it. <laughs> One wonders how did yesterday's impossible become tomorrow's inevitable. A polio-free world would be a health miracle forged by national governments all over the world and the worldwide partnership of WHO, CDC, UNICEF, Rotary International, and recently, the Gates Foundation. What Rotary brought to the table in this partnership was to identify and harness the potential of civil society, funds, advocacy with political leaders, bureaucrats, religious opinion makers, and the ultimate beneficiaries themselves. Polio eradication actually became of the people, for the people, and by the people. India's is a classic example. Rotary convinced vacillating leaders of the need for supplementary immunization in 1995. NIDs and Polio Sundays, as they are called, came into being. But as the campaign went on, health workers began to fudge immunization figures. It was an open secret, but it took Rotary to turn whistleblower. The fudging stopped. The campaign went on and on. Enthusiasm waned. Rotary lured children back to the booths with small giveaways like whistles and balloons and balls. Sometimes the central government and the state governments did not see eye to eye. It was left to the Rotarians to act as a bridge between them. Rotarians helped transport the vaccine by rail, road, camel, boat. Rumors and misinformation acquired religious overtones. Rotary organized its ulema committee, and soon mosques began asking the faithful to take children to the booths. Allowing children to take drops became a bargaining chip for other social benefits. Rotary responded with free medical camps and free polio corrective surgery camps. We believe that experience gained in polio eradication, a top-class surveillance and delivery network, funds raised from within the community, involvement of civil society will form the bedrock on which all future health and social endeavors will rest. That, we believe, is the true road ahead. Thank you so much. You did it, 30 years in, in three right. minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. And Rotary really has done incredible work. Now. We've touched on regional leadership um, already today, so I'm going to turn to the government of the UAE next. And actually, I'm really pleased that the Sheikh touched on this earlier on um, today. You know, many people are, are not aware that in the Muslim world, inoculation, as it used to be called, has been practiced for centuries, you know, most notably in Ottoman Turkey in the 1700s. And the UAE is, um, has a history of giving 
to health-related causes. There's been a new pledge uh, from the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi. And um, with us is the uh, Minister for International Cooperation and Development, Sheikha Lubna. Thank you very much, Michelle. And um, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. And Alan, I do share your sentiments about the short feet. <laughs> Probably even worse than you. Um, let me say that we are very delighted to be hosting um, the summit in the UAE, in the first ever, and um, to bringing the like of minds in here um, towards commitment and combating um, such illness. Um, this is part of our tradition. We've done it a long time. Uh, the commitment here in the United Arab Emirates is not just about our children, but about the children of the world and the outreach programs in many aspects, uh, whether eradication of poverty or um, illnesses, diseases, is, has got a long history here in the United Arab Emirates. Um, we, are the, we are the presence, we are the, the adults of today, but the children are actually the adults of the future. And when we think about this, um, we are entrusted for the children of leaving a better planet. We are trusted in giving them the right life and education and health. And when you think about it, as an, the, uh, a healthy child, or an educated child, or a capable child of actually delivering and being productive in the future means that that child has to be um, prepped well in, um, in childhood today. And uh, um, f so for us, the, the responsibility or the commitment toward uh, raising healthy children is a primary um, uh, responsibility to all nations and not just the United Arab Emirates. And what would be a better investment than the vaccines? Um, um, uh, the vaccines actually ensure a better life for children in the future. And that means that it's just part equally to, as you think of education uh, going forward. Um, for us, we have seen um, the commitment of His Highness and part of the, the commitments that we've, we've seen um, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi, made an early commitment two years ago with uh, uh, Bill Gates toward $100 million uh, committed to this particular program, vaccines and eradication of polio. But yesterday we heard of a further commitment, and, uh, and the, in my belief, this is, the, the, this is basically an encouragement to. Um, um, move forward and to make sure that we do um, reach the, the last mile. Um, Bill Gates said yesterday, last night, that um, when we look at er eradication, we don't talk about a half percent or a one percent left. He's talking about zero. Zero means that we have to work our best till we reach the last mile. But the last mile is always the hardest mile. So this commitment means that the like of all of us here in this room, we have to have this thinking and, and this, this, um, this plan in our mind where the commitment is shared by everyone and the delivery is shared by everyone. What will come out of a, um, a commitment in such, uh, such programs such as the vaccine for polio is basically a legacy plan. This legacy plan becomes a great example for other programs in health and vaccine. Thank you. Thank you so much, and, and I hope in the discussion, and, and in the discussion later on, I do want to talk about the broader benefits that um, will hopefully um, stem from, from this anti-polio plan. So I talked earlier about um, the anti-polio drive needing um, champions, and another one of those from polio endemic countries is uh, Muhammad Ali Pate, who led uh, the, the campaign in Nigeria before he took up his current broader role as Minister of State for Health. Thank you. <clears throat> I bring you warm greetings from His Excellency, the President of Nigeria, Dr. Goodluck Ebele Jonathan, and the good people of Nigeria. Let me also appreciate the government of UAE, the co-host, Mr. Bill Gates, who is an inspiring leader for all of us working on global health, to global polio eradication initiative partners that are here who have been very steadfast with all of us. I would like to say that in Nigeria, we have an unprecedented level of political commitment from His Excellency the President and from our governors at all levels uh, where we have state task forces in addition to the presidential task force. I want to acknowledge the leadership of His Eminence, the Sultan, and the 192,000 traditional leaders who are all over northern Nigeria who work steadfastly with us in rains, in difficult climates, despite all challenges, his eminence's leadership and his also uh, commitment to this has really been remarkable for us. 
In Nigeria, we've seen tremendous improvement in the program with improvement in population immunity over the last four years from 42% to more than 80% in four years. And that is as a result of dedication from lots of partners, but also health workers out in the field working in difficult circumstances. Now, there have been a lot of innovations, search capacity, use of technology, improving micro plans, improving supervisions that have led us to achieve those improvements that give us confidence that polio can be eradicated from, from, from Nigeria and also from the world. The security challenges have not stopped us. We've not militarized it. We believe that working with partners, enlightening our population is the way to go without militarizing this issue. But we do not consider polio as and routine immunization as either or. We've been able to push hard in improving routine immunization while also making progress in polio eradication. Our president launched the Saving One Million Lives initiative that has a component on routine immunization. We've introduced new vaccines, pentavalent vaccines with the support of Gavi and other partners, and we are continuing to push along to introduce new macocal vaccine this year while making progress in polio eradication. Before I came here, His Excellency, Mr. President, asked me to announce an additional commitment from the federal government of Nigeria in 2013 of additional $30 million in addition to what we've already provided for and fully funded in the immunization program this year. This $30 million is for 2013 additional for routine immunization and polio eradication initiative. And of course, all the funds for 2013 in the budget of $55 million for the immunization program in total have already been released, which makes federal government spending $85 million in 2013 alone. And we commit to maintaining the level of commitment that we have for polio, at least $30 million until the end of his administration. So I really would like to thank all the partners for continuing to believe in us and that this can be done and together we'll make it. Thank you. Thank you very much. The commitment from the polio endemic countries is really, really important. Well, that just leaves one person on the panel who hasn't had his say as yet, um, and that is um, Bill Gates. Um, Bill Gates, you, you talked about ending polio being your number one priority. Why polio? Well, the polio eradication campaign uh, started back in 1988, and the, the Gates Foundation was not, not at all involved. The key partners were Rotary, uh, who's played an amazing role, uh, WHO, UNICEF, and uh, the United States CDC. And they got it off to a, a wonderful start. Uh, you know, in fact, uh, by 2000, uh, the number of cases had come down, and everybody probably thought in three or four years uh, it was going to be done. And so our foundation uh, became a donor in uh, 1999, uh, and we kept uh, increasing what we were giving because we thought, hey, this is very close to being done. And what a wonderful gift to the world to not worry about this disease and to save all the costs that the entire world is spending uh, protecting children. Uh, it's literally going to be tens of billions that we'll save all over the world when we no longer have to give uh, the polio vaccine. And so we thought this would be a huge victory for global health. It would energize us to move on to other diseases. Um, so we were uh, certainly uh, a little naive as we saw that uh, between 2000, um, 2009, 2010, the number of cases did not uh, drop down to zero. In fact, it bounced around quite a bit, uh, uh, including a couple of setbacks. And so I think the entire polio community uh, was stepping back and saying, okay, what do we need to do differently? How do we need to rededicate ourselves uh, to this challenge? And that's why over the, the last three years, uh, we've come up with the new plan. And this is a plan that uh, uh, everybody's had a chance to review. Uh, it's a plan that uh, has uh, some contingencies in it for things that ne need to get done. Uh, and that's a plan that spends the five and a half billion dollars. Uh, that's a lot of money, uh, but that's uh, what people feel it's going to take. Now, when you think about that, that's buying vaccines, that's paying vaccinators, that's doing the surveillance, uh, that's getting the awareness out there. And when we first saw that number, that was not a number that was determined by how much could be raised. It was a number that was determined by what, what was necessary uh, to, to get this job done and really not underestimate it like 
uh, all of us had been doing for a number of years. And when people saw that, they thought, wow, you know, this is a tough time uh, to be going out and asking for a, uh, this new program uh, to get that, uh, that type of, of commitment. Uh, we see it as, as the top priority because the benefits are so large. Now this connection with routine immunization, uh, which the number of lives that that can save is so fundamental and the systems you create around that. Uh, and so as part of that, we decided that you know, we'd step up uh, to an even new level uh, in terms of our commitment uh, to this plan. And so I'm, I'm pleased to announce for the foundation uh, that uh, we're committed to fund a third of uh, what's needed for this campaign. Uh, so for the fully funded campaign, that'll be $1.8 billion uh, that we're committed to. In fact, if we take the great commitments uh, we've heard on this panel, uh, some that we'll hear about later today uh, from uh, Norway and Ireland and others, and we look at, at what's been raised for this campaign, uh, we can see that uh, because uh, people have really stepped up, uh, even though it hasn't been easy for them, uh, there's been a total of four billion raised here. Uh, And so that gives us 73% of what we had in mind. Uh, and I think there's a pretty clear road uh, to get uh, to the 100%. Uh, there's a number of countries that uh, have long been uh, big contributors to the polio campaign, uh, like the United States, Japan, and others, uh, who uh, have made near-term commitments, but as, as, as their uh, involvement goes out over the, the, the next five or six years, perhaps for a multi-year commitment. Uh, as we get some more philanthropists in, um, the four billion includes, uh, other than our foundation, uh, 335 million from philanthropists. And that total, I expect, uh, there's a number who are uh, taking a look at this. I think that number will go up to 600 million, so somewhat over 10% of the campaign. Uh, and so it's, this is kind of a novel thing that's been done. You'll have a total of about 40% that's philanthropy, about 60% uh, that are the super uh, generous uh, government donors. Uh, and so I think uh, you know, one thing we can say is based on, on what, what's happened here today, the financing will not be the thing uh, that stands in the way of us achieving uh, the miracle of, of polio eradication. What an incredible place to be in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bill Gates. I just want to remind everyone of those figures. So five and a half billion is what is needed to achieve this goal over the next six years by the end of 2018. So the pledges um, already total four billion. And what that translates into is a billion vaccinated children, a billion children who are able to be reached um, with vaccines, which is incredible. Could I ask you one more thing, though, Bill Gates? Um, why is the money needed? essentially upfront like this. You know, you've put together this plan, you, you've costed it, and you want it right there, literally in the bank, ideally, before, you know, well, as soon as possible. Yeah, we need the commitment. Uh, and many of these commitments are over the, the six-year period. But without that, the pieces don't come together. You know, we have to go to the vaccine manufacturers and say, you know, give us your high volume price, keep the factory focused on these vaccines. We have to go out and hire talented people. We have to get the cold chain systems and make the investments in those. Uh, we have to have the surveillance laboratories with really uh, top people. We have to do this new work to tie the routine immunization and the uh, polio campaigns together. In countries like uh, Nigeria and, and Pakistan, we've actually added quite a, a large number of additional workers. So the statistical measurement work that goes on is uh, 10 times as intense now to see, OK, where are we missing these kids? What do we need to do uh, using some of these new technologies? And so the only way that that can really work is if it's a, a six-year plan. When we were in the mode of saying, will we get enough money for next year, the next year, we were delaying some of the campaigns. 
Uh, we weren't able to hire the teams and get those teams to make long-term plans. And so this is really the rational way uh, to take an enemy that's proven to be more difficult than we expected and get all that IQ, all that uh, uh, certainty uh, to, to get the job yeah. done. Um, Hamid Jafri, and hopefully what it will mean is that you, you won't have to come back to donors a few years down the road and say, actually, we need more. That when we say a, a, a final push, because I think you, you could sense that, you know, no one, it's, it's not easy for anyone to, to give funds on this kind of scale, and everyone wants to feel like this really is the final push. Absolutely. I think we'll go much uh, lower on the begging now <clears throat> and, and really focus on the delivery of the, of the program. And, and as uh, uh, Bill mentioned, uh, one of the reasons the program is delayed is that we were cutting campaigns back and making the program vulnerable to, to, to outbreaks. And I, I do want to add, uh, uh, Michelle, that um, uh, uh, the involvement of Mr. Gates in this, in this program has brought a level of rigor and accountability that I think should assure all the donors uh, uh, who are pledging uh, here today. I had the honor of, of sitting across him in India for about an hour, answering his questions about the program, and we still, ha still have uh, endemic transmission. And uh, his depth of knowledge and understanding of the program is such that he will make sure that we are all accountable on the delivery of the, of, of the program. And, and that was particularly a very humbling experience for me because I, uh, uh, I was just blown away by his knowledge of the program, and I had not even taken the first uh, Microsoft Office tutorial uh, in my work, and so this was a, a, a tremendous, uh, so this is really the point I'm trying to make is to assure all the donors that the level of rigor and accountability that, that Mr. Gates' own involvement brings to this is extraordinary. And that is really important from the donor's perspective. Um, Hans-Jürgen Beerfels, you, you were talking earlier about how you feel more coordination is needed, but I mean, this is a plan that has really been thought through every step of it. Yes, and it's very impressive, uh, but uh, I think uh, nevertheless uh, it's a necessity to fight for better coordination and uh, see uh, the entire area of action uh, we have uh, to do. Also taking into account uh, that we have to manage risks, for instance, uh, look at uh, the attacks uh, last year uh, on uh, the immunization uh, staff uh, and uh, we felt scared about that. That could, uh, that could be a danger uh, for the entire campaign uh, when uh, the risk is too high uh, for the people working for us or for the uh, volunteers uh, doing the campaign for us. And, and I like uh, to, to offer an, another uh, 5 million euro for now and for 2013 uh, for conditions for better protection of our immunization staff and of our volunteers to GPEI. Thank you very much. Well, Shenaz Vazir Ali, that danger has not passed, has it? That danger for the frontline workers is still there? Uh, no, it has not passed. Uh, the danger is still there. It's hard to predict um, when the next, next attack will take place or if it will take place. And we greatly appreciate Germany's concern and that of all the other partners. And Mr. Bill Gates and his foundation works very, very closely with us in the field. As the Pakistan um, establishment in terms of the administration, the management, executive authorities, political, work very closely together along with the army. Uh, the military of Pakistan is, as you know, is a very important partner for us in certain parts of Pakistan where there is still operation uh, going on. Uh, so, as I said, it's um, un highly unfortunate, of course, that these attacks took place. And I will say this, that they took us somewhat unexpectedly. And uh, we were not quite expecting this level of hostility and targeted attacks. Um, there has been some resist resistance. Of course, there are reservations uh, about polio vaccines, and we've talked about that earlier. Uh, however, these attacks, I think, are also... Uh, in many ways, very political statements that are being made. This is not just about stopping a polio worker from administering a polio, the polio vaccine. It's really about the political context in which these attacks are taking place. Uh, Pakistan has taken several measures at the district, sub-district level, in critical areas, 
um, and uh, with the security establishment, with the law enforcing agencies uh, to ensure protection of our polio teams, uh, to have um, a very specific threat determination and assessments. And our polio teams are partnered with security personnel when they go to the field in areas where we have some anticipated information and knowledge about where a threat is going to take place. Uh, so, I, as I said, I think this is one of the challenges that we do face um, in insecure areas. And there are also largely the areas where accessibility geographically, physically, and for other reasons has been very difficult yeah. for us. And Deepa Kapoor, you, you talked about involving the, the mosques in, in India, didn't you, in, as, as part of your, uh, well, when you, you, you tried to, you had, there were areas in India where you had to bridge this kind of divide or this perception about what you were trying to do. Well, I could go on for about an hour on that. But uh, yes, we faced religious-based resistance. It wasn't quite as bad as targeting people and actually killing them. But a few health workers who went to immunize children were actually pushed off rooftops. And people were constantly hiding children because of rumors that the vaccine had something haram in it or uh, was prohibited under religious edicts. The way we went about it was to actually go personally. It was worst in the state of Uttar Pradesh. So we went to each revenue district, and there were over 70 of them in Uttar Pradesh, and um, cajoled and persuaded religious leaders there about the need for immunization and how it was their beholden duty to God to save the children. They eventually came on board and we got them together in one room where we had 70 odd people sitting with different interests, slightly different faiths, but they all came together under one umbrella and the Muslim Ulema Committee of Rotary International was formed. Very soon, um, from every mosque, there were some mosques with boots in them. Maria Clevis from UNICEF is sitting here. Hamid Jafri is here. We together worked on it, WHO, UNICEF, and Rotary. And very soon, um, it was the done thing to take your child to the Gosh, booth. To but immunize. it required that kind of human contact, the, the persuading, the cajoling. So, so interesting. Surya Dalil, t tell us more about what it will take then to achieve this goal in Afghanistan, because you're on, you know, the next year is going to be one of tremendous change in your country. And of course, again, there will be a risk in that as to how that might affect a, a drive like this. Thank you. Let me tell you that we have seen a remarkable and steady uh, decline in number of polio cases in Afghanistan. We had 80 cases in 2011. We had 37 cases in 2012. And so far in, in, in this year, we have two cases. These two cases of polio, they are not in the south. Last year, more than half of the cases of polio was in the south part of the country. But this new, two new cases of polio this year are located in the eastern part of the country and very close to the border with Pakistan. And those are places, they are very districts that are remote and there are pockets of children who have been, who have not be, been reached with polio vaccination or with uh, immunization programs at all. So the, the for us, the effort this year and next year is to really make sure that those bordering places in Afghanistan, all those pockets of children, whether they are 50 children, they are 100 children, they are 150 children, whatever the numbers are, we reach them. And that will require extra effort because those number of children, they are places where there are um, on and off conflict. There's also some military movement going on in those areas. Um, so in, in many of those places, we don't have security forces on a regular basis. So that will require extra effort to make sure. And it's very important that both Afghanistan and Pakistan join hands and make sure that whether they reach from their side or we reach from our side, it doesn't matter. Those are our children and those are children that, that we have moral commitment to make sure that they have been vaccinated. So that's where 
both of us, uh, Madame Shahnaz Ali and myself, come together very often and we say, we have to make sure that our teams, our field team, vaccination teams in east part of the country or in south, because we share a long border, they work together with each other, we are cross-border operations. Children who are moving through these borders, where they are moving through the checkpoints, formal checkpoints, or through the various gates that exist, they receive vaccination. Okay. I want to take a moment, um, if I may, to just ask um, Alan Duncan and also Julian Fantino about what you hope that your taxpayers' money will achieve beyond polio. Julian Fantino. I defer to Canada. <laughs> You're very kind. Thank you. Well, in essence, uh, if it's predictable, it's preventable. We are committed as a society to look after as much as we can uh, and help those in greater need, and, and this is part of our mission. It's part of a responsible society. Canadians are very generous people. We are committed to doing what we can, and it isn't just about polio, in essence, because polio has uh, many other uh, consequences as well, ruined lives, the, the, uh, the whole issue of depriving people of an opportunity. So when you look at it, it's really the mission that we are uh, a part of with the global community to eradicate poverty, to deal with, uh, with lending a helping hand, helping those in greater need. It's part of our mission and, and certainly the Canadian International Development Agency. And uh, I'm very proud actually to be part, uh, uh, on behalf of Canadians, to be part of this uh, program. I should also mention that uh, we've been on this page uh, on the polio eradication uh, mission, if you will, since 1988. So for us, uh, we're motivated certainly by what is happening globally, the coming together, which I think is a great, great initiative. Uh, we need to do more of this to tackle more of the challenges that uh, countries, developing countries, people in need are, are facing going forward. So we're very proud to be part of this. And again, as was mentioned, uh, you know, uh, things don't just happen. I think it was John F. Kennedy who said that uh, people make things happen. And uh, uh, I, I, on behalf of Canada, want to thank Bill Gates for uh, lighting another spark to what is, in fact, uh, a winnable uh, cause and one that we're all very proud to be part of. Who knows, maybe one day the polio plan will be a blueprint for so much more besides. Alan Duncan. Uh, I hope it'll do three things. First, I hope it'll persuade other people to give as well so that we can hit the magic 5.5 billion. Uh, and if we miss out on that final half billion or something, we're missing out on the final goal. So we've got to get there to the full total and then deliver it. I hope it'll optimize um, uh, partnership and practices so that we can spend this money in the best possible way and get into the last hidden corner, without which we will never eradicate it. If you own a cupboard somewhere in a difficult country and there it is, it's gonna burst out again. So yeah. you've gotta to get to the very last corner. And I hope it'll also have a general effect um, in persuading uh, particularly democratic voters that actually a responsible government in a civilized world does have an extensive development budget. Uh, and that if we can hold up the goal um, of the eradication of polio as a success, perhaps it'll help persuade them yeah. that money and generosity can be well spent for the betterment of the world. Yeah. Well, you, you make an important point about the, you know, the, the rest of the money. And I wonder, Bill Gates, where you think or where you hope that other one and a half billion is, is going to come from. Um, <laughs> well, as I said, there, there are people like the United States and Japan, uh, Australia, who've been strong supporter of the, the polio campaign, uh, and for a variety of reasons. Multi-year commitments are often difficult for governments to make. That's why we're particularly appreciative of the ones who've... Uh, uh, found the ability to do that. But, you know, those are among the countries we'll be talking to about what are they thinking about these next six years, you know, how do they see the campaign. You know, obviously in the case of the, the U.S., uh, you have the, the Center for Disease Control that's deeply involved, actually, in the logistics, planning, making sure things are, are going uh, pretty well. So we'd be optimistic that part of that billion and a half uh, that remains uh, will come from those countries who've 
who've been in it up till now. We'll have to get a few new countries in. We'll have to get a few new philanthropists in. Uh, but, you know, frankly, uh, a month ago, you know, coming into this, I thought, okay, if we could get to three and a half billion, then we'd have the momentum. And so I, I you know, couldn't be more thrilled uh, that we've gotten to four billion. I, you know, it's not guaranteed. Uh, a lot of people in the audience will keep working hard, but I, I think it makes it extremely likely that will not be the, the limiting factor. It'll, it'll be how, we, how smart we are, you know, hiring the right workers, uh, even just a little bit of luck in terms of the, the people who go out and, and try to work against us. Yeah. Uh, but you know, our persuasive power should be strong because we have a, a very powerful, uh, worthy cause that, yeah. that we're behind. Mohamed Ali Pate, then if, if, if hopefully the financing is not going to be the problem, what do you think your biggest hurdle will be then in, in an endemic country like Nigeria? Well, a few, just a year and a half ago when India succeeded, we went and sat with Hamid Jaffrey and tried to understand what India did so that we can try to do it in Nigeria as well. One of the central issues was accountability in the program in India, and we learned how India got to that, and we tried to replicate it in the context of the task force. The challenge is the front line, how to hold those who are playing out in the front lines accountable for achieving results, to ensure that, in fact, they have accurate data, that they respond to those, and that decisions are made at the local government level. The president is committed, the governors are committed, the local government chairman in our own context uh, have been the most challenging part. So the technical side, I think we've got it fairly squared away. The political commitment in the front lines, we're working on it, and I think the accountability mechanism we've put in place is helping us reach more children, improve the quality of the program, and I believe with that, if we sustain it, we should be able to. And I guess the accountability is you know, good to show the donors, but also it's for the credibility of the plan as far as Nigerians are concerned, because the word goes out. Yes, but also one of those things that I think goes beyond polio. For routine immunization, we've now got an accountability framework for routine immunization. In our effort to save one million lives, we've sort of had an accountability for all the states so that we can be able to tell whether we're making progress or not. Okay, thank you. I just, yes, Dr. Ali and um, Sheikh Alubna, I wanted to ask you to come in before we go uh, to the floor, particularly on whether you think Islamic leadership is going to make a difference in some of these countries. Just concerning the 1.5 billion, I think there are source, the international financing organizations and institutions who cannot provide grants, but they can provide financing with the same principle that the Islamic Development Bank arranged with Budget Foundation. What happened that the IDB can provide financing to the country, to the country's concerned, and Budget Foundation did pay the cost of the money, and the country itself, they can't afford to bear the actual financing. So with this, we can easily, I think, inshallah, through international financing institutions, become mobilized with the 1.5 billion, the remaining 1.5 billion, inshallah. Inshallah. Yeah. So we, we call, <laughs> we call on the donors and the NGOs to cooperate with the international financing institutions. We can tap a lot of resources from there with a small amount of money. Okay. Thank you. Sheikh Alubna. Um, first, I want to emphasize that um, we, even when we talk about a concrete plan um, toward the eradication of polio, there's no cookie cutter that fits all. The program will differ from one country to another based on the um, uh, geographic structure, on the, uh, the social structure, on the government and the political message that comes through. But two parts are qu equally important. One is the message that goes through to the people for adoption um, should take equal responsibility of a government political commitment, the leaders, but also um, a uh, public engagement. So the, the drive for this would be more of acceptance and adoption from the public itself. They're the one who lead the message to go through. When we talk about Islamic countries, um, what you have, you have a, an avenue for uh, increasing the success factor in the Islamic countries because you are a trusted party. And um, uh, the, uh, the United Arab Emirates has been a longstanding 
um, partner for a lot of, you know, with all the Muslim countries, and therefore um, through uh, previous contribution um, early on. So, um, in my belief, the the United Arab Emirates um, would be a um, a trusting hand that actually will see through this as part of the um, concrete uh, plan that's been um, uh, put through. Thank you. Um, I'd like to turn to your questions, and perhaps we could take a, a few of them uh, together before we put them to the panel. So if you could raise your hand if you, uh, if you have a question, and then we'll get the, um, the microphones right to you. We have a few of them right around the room. Yes, can we get one to the gentleman here um, in the table right in the center, gentleman in the brown jacket? And did I see another hand go up over there? Yes, if you get a microphone to the gentleman in the... Um, at the table in the middle there. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Go Thank ahead. you very much. My name is Ciro de Quadros. I'm from the Albert Sabin Vaccine Institute in Washington, D.C., formerly with the Pan American Health Organization. And uh, today we heard from Hamid Jafari that the India program dispelled any doubt that poly could be eradicated. And from Mr. Gates, both yesterday and today, we affirmed that now we have a comprehensive plan and the resource to implement that plan. Uh, last week I wrote a piece in the Huffington Post that I mentioned that one of the main reasons that polio was eradicated in the Americas, the first region to eradicate polio, is because we had a plan and all the money was in the bank. Yeah. So now we have that condition. Now there is another point, which in my opinion is the main impediment. This is not anymore a public health program. This now is a diplomatic program problem. And this, we also maybe have some lessons from the Americas. The Americas eradicated polio during civil wars, bloody guerrilla like the Shining Path, but there was initiative from the Pan-American Health Organization together with UNICEF, together with, uh, with the Red Cross, and with the Catholic Church, which we called Health as a Bridge for Peace. And that for the first time in history, we could have agreement between war infections to have days of tranquility. And that methodology later on was exported with Jim Grant to other parts of the world, and there were days of tranquility in other countries. So maybe we should revisit yeah. that initiative. There are papers published about that, historians have talked about that, and see what could be applied in these other parts of the world we How have that condition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And the gentleman over there, yes. Thank you. My name's Michael Sheldrick, and I'm from the Global Poverty Project, and also Australia. I'm here with my friend Akram Azimi, the Young Australian of the Year, and I just want to thank the whole panel and all the countries for your commitment. It's been incredibly inspiring, and I just want to reiterate and let you all know that we'll be taking the message back to our government in Australia and our Prime Minister and be encouraging them to follow up their words with action and join this fight through to the end. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, indeed. Um, Hamid Jaffrey. Yes, thank you. I, I wanted to uh, really not, not only respond but build on the uh, comment made by uh, Dr. De Quadros. I think he himself is one of the reasons why Americans were the first region uh, to eradicate polio, and we've learned a lot from him and the experiences in the America for the rest of the global program. The challenge is that Nigeria and Pakistan have faced recently is truly unprecedented in terms of very directed attacks on, on polio workers, and, and that has sort of created a new reality for the global program. And um, so what I would like to outline is actually the, the strategic framework under which these countries have continued to move forward. They have described some of those elements of that strategic framework to deal with the security uh, 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 threats. And ultimately, it's the local planning, local security assessment, and integration of that with the uh, operational planning that affords safety and security of the workers. So that's the first uh, element of that. Second is the operational resilience and flexibility, the speed with which the campaign is done, house to house or fixed post, number of vaccinators that you float in. All of this is being done very flexibly. Now that's the second element. Third are the communities themselves. Polio is a community empowering program. Communities vaccinate themselves, volunteers, females come from those communities, and it's the community ultimately that guarantees the security of their own, own workers. The fourth element is 
the support of the region, the Islamic institutions, the Islamic religious and political leadership. So I think this summit is a very, very important step uh, in that direction. We heard from Sheikha, the, the credibility of UAE, the love that the people of Pakistan have for this family here is incredible. And as they engage more directly with the, with the country, this could be the game changer in, 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 in Pakistan. Our regional director, uh, uh, Dr. Alwan in Emro, he has initiated uh, activities to mobilize Islamic leadership from religious to institutional and, and an Islamic advisory group is being convened to provide the space for clarification of all the misinformation that is being propagated in the name of uh, uh, religion. And then finally, these countries are implementing very aggressive containment strategies so that children who are moving in and out of areas that are inaccessible are being vaccinated along corridors of, of movement and a, a firewalling uh, by vaccination around uh, the communities that live around inaccessible yeah. areas. So there's a program of work that these countries are, are carrying forward. So we don't want security to be taken as that has paralyzed the program. In fact, they, th these countries have done a tremendous job of disaggregating the problem to the local issues and moving forward. So yeah. I just wanted to make that point. Um, I think we have, could, could we get microphones to I think three people who I can see with their, uh, with their hands up. There's a couple of other tables. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm uh, Bob Scott. I'm uh, chairman of the International Polio Plus Committee for Rotary International. And uh, of course, we're delighted with the statements that have been made today, particularly with the uh, funding uh, announcements. Just like to point out that, uh, in fact, uh, Rotary's been at this since 1979, uh, when we first had the first NID in the Philippines. And since that time, we've raised somewhere in the region of a billion dollars. And I just want to stand and say today that Rotarians are still committed to see this to the end. And uh, we announced uh, $75 million per year for the next three years back in October, November. And today, on behalf of Rotary, I'm saying that we will continue to finance as well as we can maybe not in the billion levels, because we're not quite that big, but certainly in the multi-million levels until 19, until this thing is over, as we promised the children way back in 1979. Thank Just wanted you so to say much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think, yes, um, so you have a question. Um, my name is Hussein Zakaria from Nigeria. A teleguide, teledaia, a columnist, and of course a daia. Uh, my people have a lot of apprehension and fear, and these are setbacks to achieving the complete eradication of polio in uh, northern Nigeria. Their apprehension is who to trust. They do not trust the polio managers. They don't even trust the organ, the project. Uh, therefore, they need somebody who will uh, tell them that trust these people. What they are doing, what they are giving to you is genuine and is for your good. The only people who can take this major message to uh, the crannies of northern Nigeria are, uh, of course, the religious leaders. Okay. Could I... They have more trust. Yeah. They trust so much the religious leaders. But then these religious leaders are not informed. They are not educated as what is polio project. However, this meeting or the summit has brought three important scholars from northern Nigeria. And they have understood the message. And they want to promise you that, inshallah, when they go back to Nigeria, it will be a different success story. Okay. That, thank inshallah. You. I, thank you very much. Because we have very limited time left, Muhammad Ali Pate, I wonder if you could very quickly um, respond to that, that there is still a trust deficit in Nigeria. Yes, I think over time, 
since 2003, 2004, we've faced that challenge. But gradually, we've regained that challenge. His eminence, the presence of our religious leaders, even at this summit, is really a testimony to that fact that we've reached out, and I think we're making progress. The previous Sheikh mentioned, it's closed mind that sometimes prevents people from understanding the benefit of this to humanity. And gradually, people understand. We believe they're well-intentioned, but it's just that the dialogue has not reached the level that it is now. But we're very pleased with this uh, development, and we'll follow up with our religious leaders. And we have been with the traditional leaders as well as other religious leaders all over Nigeria, both Christian and Muslim leaders in parts of the country, for instance. We know that there are churches that don't take drugs, but there are also Muslim clerics that have this issue of trust with government, with the polio program. But that is gradually being dispelled because it's a global initiative, and that other countries, Muslim, non-Muslim, India, other countries have also done it. So I think we're making progress. Thank yes. you. Very briefly, Shanaz Wazir. Thank you, Michelle. I think it, uh, the, there are many messages uh, that are coming out from the summit today uh, in a more pronounced way. One is, of course, when um, people in the Muslim world and Muslim countries, our three countries in particular, hear about the Islamic Development Bank financing polio eradication, when they know the summit is taking place here in the UAE, a very, very prominent and strong Islamic country, when they hear about support from religious leaders, the voices across the Muslim world, not just one Muslim country, but across the Muslim world, when they hear about uh, Muslim organizations in their local context, their local mosque, ulema, the religious leaders, uh, with their fatwas. I think this is a combination of what needed to be done, uh, both globally, regionally, at the country and sub-country, uh, sub-national level. I think the, this is important for us because if there are reservations about uh, what Islam is saying with regard to polio eradication, we need to counter those in a, with, a, with evidence, with rationality, and with very, very strong messaging. So I think for us, this, this, uh, this summit is very, very important and very strategic in many ways. Thank you very much. Um, we are nearly out of time on this session. I just want to remind you of what we've heard today, that it's $4 billion raised towards this um, total that is needed of $5.5 billion. Um, clearly, there is work still to do, and there are more stakeholders who can make a difference. So I'd now like to introduce our last speaker, who's going to um, join us um, on the stage now, the President of the European Commission, Jose Manuel Barroso. Ministers, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. First of all, let me thank Abu Dhabi for receiving us here today, for organizing this very important conference, for their hospitality. I'd like also to thank Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for this very important initiative. Ladies and gentlemen, of course, I don't have to convince you of the need to fight for immunization and polio eradication. We all know that every day there are 19,000 clear and convincing reasons for doing so, because that is the number of children under the age of five who on average die every day from perfectly preventable causes. More and more, the world unites to bring this tragedy, this insult to human dignity, to an end, because it is simply unacceptable. We can stop this, and we will. And this impressive conference is another milestone in this global effort, and the European Union is proud to be part of that coalition. It shows how this campaign continues to gather momentum, in particular, the enormous energy and effort that Bill Gates puts into this is an inspiration to us all. Ladies and gentlemen, the European Union is and remains the largest donor of development aid in the world. The European Commission alone commits more than 8 billion euros. A significant part of that aid, over one-fifth, goes to social sectors. This means that half a billion a year goes to health initiatives, because that is where it makes a real difference for our partners. Investing in health systems is not just a social imperative, it is also, if you will, good economics, as it helps tackle the root causes of underdevelopment, poverty, and instability. Through a comprehensive approach, we can improve health systems, provide better access to health services, invest in related areas like nutrition, sanitation, and clean water, 
and address the broader social issues that impact health. These broader policies are indispensable to make specific immunization campaigns effective and sustainable. And just now, in this part of the debate, we heard some of the concrete difficulties and obstacles that exist when we try to put the programs really on the ground. This is why we, in fact, support this holistic approach, linking the health policy, health as part of our development aid policy, to a broader concept of support to countries. This is why we have also integrated these specific lines of support to health in our country-by-country -country programs. And the impressive results that have been achieved over the years in polio eradication are an excellent example for this comprehensive division of labor between us and our partners. Government efforts, public and private donors have all made this possible, with the European Union contributing substantially along with other very important donors. Let me just outline of a few of our actions. In Afghanistan and Nigeria, for instance, we have supported health and immunization systems for a total of 258 million and 85 million euro, respectively, over the last seven years. On the global stage, we have funded routine immunization through the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization with 83 million euro. And we have already announced an additional amount of 10 million euro to support Gavi's work to 2015. Moreover, our strategy of comprehensive health support does not exclude specific support to actions such as the Global Polio Eradication Initiative, as we have done on a regional basis in West Africa and Nigeria, commitments which together amount to over 130 million euro. But let us, not, let us be clear that it is not just money that makes a difference, but the people, the huge success in bringing down polio is to a large extent the work of routine immunization services and their health workers, courageous men and women who devote their lives to preventing death, who in some regions even endanger their own lives to save others. Let me use this opportunity to commemorate those that have been attacked and killed recently when carrying out immunization programs and honor the brave health workers who refuse to give up even in the face of threats. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to be very clear on one strategic point. The European Union will keep its leadership on development cooperation. Even in, uh, admittedly, financially difficult times, we are securing and deepening our toolbox, including aid. More specifically, we envisage at least 20% of our multi-annual aid budget, 2014-2020, to be devoted to human development and social inclusion, including health, and this in the future as well. Together with my colleague of the Commission, Commissioner Andris Pivox, responsible for development that has been with you during all this work, we are now preparing the next budget. We are in the final uh, decisions. There was, uh, for those familiar with the European Union decision-making process, it's not always very easy. But there was an agreement between the member states. Now we are discussing with the European Parliament. Our aim is to have it up and running from the, from the 1st of January 2014 until 2020. And I can promise you, because I know from that we can count with the support of the European Parliament, that we'll keep, in fact, a very important action in this field of development aid, including the social sectors and including, certainly, health with a prominent role. We particularly intend to increase our financing for health research in low-income countries. For instance, through a five-fold increase of the European Commission contribution to the European and Developing Countries Clinical Trials Partnership, which aims at development of new drugs and vaccines for HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. Also, earlier this month, we have pledged to at least maintain our current level of support to the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria. Regarding polio eradication, as such, we intend to continue our substantive health sector support to two of the three countries where the wild polio virus, unfortunately, still circulates. I can announce today that the European Union Commission plans to set aside, for the seven years to come, over 1.3 billion euro of aid for Nigeria and Afghanistan. 
and that in our dialogue with these partner countries, we have proposed to make health one of the three key sectors of development cooperation. Furthermore, on top of our country level and our global health support, I am pleased to announce today a very specific and immediate support action. We will join partners in giving further support to the Global Polio Eradication Initiative with 5 million euro already implementable this year, just now. So in the future, as in the past, the European Union will be a key ally in the global effort for immunization. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this campaign for immunization is not just a health action. It is a moral imperative. The world cannot watch idly while preventable, shameful deaths occur every day. We all have our roles to play in an effective division of labor, and I'm happy to see that all of us here are so strongly committed to living up to this responsibility. I thank you very much for your attention.